I've been really blessed over the years to have a lot of great mentors and people that I've learned from in terms of my golf journey, my teaching journey, but there's definitely one that has played a very, very big role, and that is Dana Dahlquist. A lot of you know Dana. He recently was named the number ninth teacher in America, which I was super excited about because I've seen Dana's journey from, you know, going back 15 years to now and, and how he's evolved as a coach. And I have a lot of respect for how he's gone about doing that. I recently traveled out to Long Beach and I asked him a question, Dana, what are your top five myths of the golf swing? Let's see what he has to say. All right, Dana, so you've been teaching for a while now and obviously collected a lot of knowledge over the years. Mm -hmm. We've seen the industry go in and out of different phases. Talk about that process a little bit and what you've kind of observed from that. Yeah, so it's really interesting, Josh, because um, I think the, a way to get a good sample size of the industry is to do lessons. It's not necessarily just jumping online. I mean, that is one facet, but looking how students actually interact with maybe the internet and what they see online. I get a lot of questions that come in um, a lot from students like, hey, Dana, I saw this on the internet. Does this pertain to me? And I think that's good because that means that we're actually reaching out and touching people mm -hmm. um, in a good way. But there are some problems with that and we're gonna go into that. Awesome, well, uh, let's start backwards. Let's start with number five, what do you think? Yeah, I think the big one is number five would be lag. Okay, so there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way. What's interesting is lagging the club independently with just my wrists or pulling on my arms is gonna cause some conflict with the student with contact and face control in their golf swing. Show us what you mean by the, the face control. Yeah, so if I go to the top of my swing and I start to, let's say, pull on wrist angles, okay, where I'm actually pulling down on the club, it starts to potentially open the club face. And you can see my left wrist starts to open when I start to pull down independently. And when that happens, my brain knows that the face is starting to lay wide open. Okay. Probably not gonna wanna rotate. So what's the, what's the correct way to create leg? Yeah, so the correct way um, is as the club's going back and it's reaching the top of the backswing, I'm actually changing directions in my body. And when I'm changing directions, that means that the club's still going back as my body's going the other way. When that starts to occur, I'm actually crea creating an X factor stretch. Okay. The X factor stretch is gonna allow the body to create separation. That's actually the definition of that. And when that starts to happen, I'm producing a force which is causing torque okay. in my system. That torque is allowing the arms to change direction and then the wrist change direction, which is actually gonna allow the face to change direction as well as a result. And who would you say does a really good job of this on tour? Well, I think the, the one that I like to watch the most do this is Rory McIlroy. Okay. So he's a good example of a draw player that does it. All right, Dana. Love that, number four. Yeah, number four um, is actually getting depth on your backswing. Okay. Um, so we know that getting depth on your backswing is important. Okay, I'm not gonna argue that. There's a lot of different ways to skin that cat. Um, there's examples of Scotty Shuffler, like Scotty Shuffler, his hands go in, okay? How they go in is really important. Um, and then conversely, you have other players that get depth at the top in other fashions. But we have to be careful with that. We have to identify what you do and what you don't do in order for you to get depth. The reason why players may want to get depth on their backswing is because their hand path is coming out on the downswing and they're hitting, let's say, deflected cuts or pulls. Um, and this is pretty doable if you just film your golf swing and you see your hand path is working out. If that is the case, you want to kind of explore depth, but you want to do it the right way. What you don't want to do, and this is for the masses, is you don't want to take your left arm in your setup and start pulling the butt end of the club in early around you. And the reason for that is you're actually taking your left arm across your chest very, very early, and it's shutting off the actual rotation of how your body loads. Um, it doesn't mean that the hands don't go in. A good example of this would be like Dustin Johnson. So Dustin Johnson is one of the best at we would say a rotational golfer mm -hmm. um, and, and guys like him, when they take the club back, the club gets thrown more or less down the line and then further as the player moves from, let's say club shaft parallel to lead arm parallel, the left arm starts looking more in and that's because of the body's rotation, not because they start pulling the arm across the chest early. So I'm gonna play devil's advocate here real fast. So yeah. I think, the player you're describing would kind of be like a Matt Kuchar, mm -hmm. correct? Someone correct. that 
takes his hands in. Yeah. Um, having success at a high level, yeah. but ultimately, what are the downsides to that? Well, one of the big downsides is potentially your path starts to work more out okay. as doing such. So the more that I pull the arm more across the chest early, it's going to probably go up and out on the downswing unless I did something, you know, mysteriously wrong. Um, the other thing that's very, very interesting is it really is hard on speed production. Okay. More the left arm pulls across the chest early, you're not loading your scalp appropriately at the right time. So when things don't load and unload as dynamically as possible. Yeah, so Matt's obviously a great player, uh, yeah. but doesn't hit it far. So that, that's where a potential limitation could come from yeah. that. Yeah, so um, another one would be like Bryson. So like Bryson has a lot of depth at the top, but if you look at Bryson, he actually takes the club down the line on the backswing and then loads it more through the transition, i.e. that's why he hits it. Far. So when he's getting that depth is really important. 100%. Love that. All right, Dana, so what's your number three myth? Yeah, number three is the, the, the conversation about keeping your head still. Okay. You know, there's a lot of ways we can go about this. Um, I think it's important to note that some of the best swings that we like to look at have head movement. Um, it doesn't mean they're all the same, um, but I think the big thing is just don't keep it completely still. Your neck is one of the most mobile parts of your spine and your head's attached to it. We don't want to lose our balance either, right? So if you move your head too much, you actually have to try to stabilize to keep your balance. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a fine line. I think if you look at most good golf swings, uh, look at Dustin Johnson, on his backswing, his head actually rotates to the right. And that's one of the reasons why he has very good mobility and range of motion. But at the same token, like, you don't want to move it so much that you lose sight of the ball either. Yeah, I played in a pro-am the other day and the golfer I was playing with would, would hit shots and literally try to keep his head down, you know, three or four seconds after it left the face. So I, I think there's a big misunderstanding there from an am amateur level of, of what the head is actually mm -hmm. doing. Mm -hmm. um, but on the flip side, you know, obviously we know the more the head moves, the more speed you could potentially create. Um, what's kind of that sweet spot for you of, of a little bit of head movement, but not too much? Yeah, you want to think of it from more of the sequence, right? So like if I was moving my body in the backswing, okay, so the club's gone back, I rotated. When I get to in range of motion, I might let my eye line move slightly to the right. And the same is true after I get to the lead side on the downswing and I start to rotate. As I come through the shot, I let the head release. So it's part of the whole system movement. Um, we don't want to ever have limiting factors that are kind of staring us in the in the face whenever we look at our golf swing. Yeah, and actually, if you watch Dustin Johnson hit a wedge, as he, he turns through, his head is already looking at the target. Reminds me of Annika, David Correct. Duvall, right? Those those are players that, you know, obviously disprove that, that, that myth. But yeah, you know, and then the other thing it seems like you're talking about is not only the left to right movement, not only the up and down, but, but the tilting of, of how the eye line is actually working. Correct. All right, Dana? Number two. Yeah, so number two is kind of a, I call it the muddy water one. Um, it's hip depth. In, in golf instruction, over my 25 years of teaching and looking at golf swings from a teaching perspective, um, there's always been an argument between these two factions of teachers that say either turn your hips or don't turn your hips. And you know what? They're both kind of right. You know, you have to kind of look at the middle ground and who you're talking to. So hip depth is, if I was looking at a perfect situation, a perfect situation would be a player that actually gets pressure to, to go to the right side. And then as the club's being taken away, you'll see most of the best ball strikers right off the ball, their hips are actually pretty square. That means that they're activating their trail side. And as they, as they activate their trail side and they start to wind up, they start to get hip depth to the point where the right leg starts to lose flex and create leg extension but they don't lose their trail glute. That would be a perfect situation, but not everybody can do that. So you get a, most demographic of golfers that are you know, the amateur players that like me for that matter, that don't have time to practice a lot. If I got in there and I said I was losing range of motion, just start increasing hip turn and let your right leg extend. But that's gonna happen to a diminishing return at some point where you're like, hey, I'm hitting the ball correctly, I'm, I have a pattern, but I wanna create more speed. Well, the elephant in the room is start to load your system so you can allow the loading of the trail hip and the trail glute, and that's what's kind of posed to the industry. So we have two issues here. Yeah. One is, I think it starts with the player who doesn't turn their pelvis, mm -hmm. 
and doesn't create rotation in the backswing. So then the correction you see to that is people just start going crazy and turning their pelvis Correct. obnoxiously, right? And Correct. you're basically saying, hey, there's, there's a point of diminishing return with that. We, we got to make sure that, yes, we're turning our pelvis, but it's sort of following a process. Correct. So that being said, let's let's talk about the rates of of how you want to see it sure. happen in the backswing. Yeah, so there is a rate in a perfect world if a player gets pressure from left foot to right foot, that's that's the precursor. Okay. And they throw the club back on the backswing. I'm actually feeling that there's a pressure build underneath the right foot. When there's a pressure build underneath the right foot, not weight, but a pressure build under the right foot. Then what starts to occur is I start engaging the trail leg to accept that pressure. That's a natural response to like an athletic mo movement, okay? So once that occurs, then the rib cage is actually rotating more than the hip. That's gonna create a nice separation piece between the rib cage and the hip. And as the momentum of that object going back, i.e. the club, and I start to rotate, you start getting a bigger gap between those two systems to a point where maybe at lead arm parallel here and you go to the top, the hip actually starts to increase its range of motion, which allows me to get enough depth in the pelvis. So you see more of a late recentering move. 100%. I think, I know you love Rory's swing. Yeah. Rory's got that really late push. Correct. That re recenters his pelvis. It's, it's not just spinning from the no. start. No, 100%. I think that's the misconception. So you get the guys that you know, you look at Xander, he does this, you know, this is kind of like his signature, this is Rory's signature. And this is what kind of makes them who they are. If they, mm -hmm. if they lose that, they're no longer that player and it becomes manual. And this is one of the problems when we look at mechanics as a whole. Mechanics are kind of representations of good ground force reactions and good kinetics at the forefront. So what happens if, if a player doesn't have the range of motion or mobility to kind of do what you're saying? Then we have to look at other avenues. So that's where we, we look at ourselves in the mirror as a coach and go, okay, if this player is not able to do these things, then we're gonna have to curtail them by increasing range of motion early. So this is where a player might actually turn their hips with their rib cage more at the same time. And maybe the hand path works a little more in than what's desirable. But those things are going to make the player more accurate and more consistent over time. And it's not a bad avenue to go through. So not ideal, but definitely could maybe be a workaround there. 100%. All right, Dana, we've made it. What is the number one myth that you've seen in the golf swing? Yeah, so the number one myth, and I attach myself to this for twofold. Um, it is a downswing related thing, okay? And we would call that hip turn on the downswing. Okay. Um, hip turn on the downswing should be a byproduct of what you did on the backswing. Okay. And there's a lot of ways to skin this cat. There's guys that have made millions upon millions of dollars with different aspects of their downswing. So we have to not just look at our golf swing video and go, oh, I don't have my hip two cheeks showing on video. Like that's probably the number one thing. Guys come in and they, they want to have this massive looking hip turn. And to be honest, um, some of the best players in the world don't have that and nor have they ever. But the principle of rotation is what we have to understand. The rotation on the downswing is a byproduct of good loading on the backswing first. I call it the domino effect. So if a player comes in and they don't load up and they have maybe because of that, a hand path that's out and they have early extension, obviously they're not gonna be able to facilitate more rotation because they're just gonna slice the ball off the planet. But they spend an exorbitant amount of time trying to manually create this open pelvis look with disregarding that they didn't load their system on the backswing in the first place. So conveniently, a lot of the lessons that I do never even objectively talk about hip turn. We, we talk about like using the ground differently, which i.e. influences that anyway, and may give you that look. But like I said, it's a dangerous thing to start talking so about. So I think to clarify, I've been around you for a while now, you do like to see the knees squared up by P5. Mm -hmm and you do like to see the pelvis open at impact. Yes. You wanna demonstrate that real yeah. fast and so, just kinda of show what we're talking so about? So at, at P5, um, when the lead arm is parallel to the ground and the club basically is already finished changing direction and it's loaded, I'd like to see that the knees so right are here. actually square Okay. and the hips might be five degrees open at that point. Okay. That would be kind of, if I was saying I had kind of a, a picture of something, that's what it would look like. And then at impact, I would probably see the hips were more open, you know, upwards of, you know, at least 38 degrees or more 
um, for everyone, okay? But, and even more than that, for the best players in the world. But that's kind of a representation of good separation. So that's where we're kind of getting towards. If a player is not able to do that on the backswing, they're probably not gonna be able to do it on the downswing. So interjecting manual application, which IE is just spinning the hips, um, is probably not gonna create separation. So I get a lot of players um, who try to do hip turn and their arms and chest match up and they're really spun open. Or sometimes I get players that never get to their lead side and their pressure's back and they're open. And it's feeding a lot of pull fades constantly. So what we want to try to do for the most golfers is still allow them to kind of get things to be either straight or a draw, especially for the masses. And in order to get the proper hip sequence, getting the backswing right, getting your pressure to land appropriately and getting separation, and then pushing through the ground to open you up will actually facilitate the right pitcher that you're looking for. So I'm curious why you have this at number one if everything else is backswing. Well, I see a lot of it on the internet, okay. right? So I see a lot of, um, well, a good example is you see a lot of the young guys coming up that have this look of a lot of rotation and a lot of side bend, like let's say Joaquin Neiman. But we're looking at outliers, right? Like players that actually have exceptionally good ground force reaction and players that have a lot of mobility and they actually load really well. And if you don't do that, there's no potential way for you to get open. And I see a lot of juniors coming in and they, the first thing they say is, you know, I want to look like Sam Bennett where I'm really, really open. And I'm like, well, look, like, let's get the backswing loaded first before we even attempt to go down that road. All right, Dana, so that being said, how should the average Joe attack this myth? Yeah, so I think for the average person, I think if you put more emphasis on through the transition, getting your pressure to land into your lead side first, um, and through that transitionary period, are the arms and hands shaft, i.e. body in the right place, and then see where the dominoes fall from there. You're probably gonna react a lot better and you're gonna be open enough, okay? I think it's all, always gonna be a case of three factors. Do you have enough vertical and enough push up and back and open to circumvent good contact and good distribution of ball flight? If you don't and your pressure's back and everything's working at the same time, probably not gonna be a good idea to start chasing pitchers. This is where I see a lot of people do manual things like the arms are too far out, the shaft's too flat, the pressure's too back. And the only thing it does is it feeds the beast of them hitting more pull cuts. So the number one thing I would say whenever you're faced with this adversity of I can't get open, get the precursor done right, get your pressure to get down and left earlier and get a better sequence through the transition. Special thanks to Dana for taking his time and, and dropping those knowledge bombs. Uh, I'm going to be curious to ask him the same question two or three years down the road and see if anything is the same or if anything has changed. If you're interested in getting more of mine and Dana's content, head over to hipbombs.com. We have laid out an entire swing blueprint starting from the setup all the way to the finish and everything in between. We appreciate all the support. We'll see you next time.